All right. Well, for the last lecture, I thought I'd do something of an epilogue. Now, in a way, if we look at this period, 1914 to 1989, where we left off the other day, it's sometimes called the short 20th century. I mean, in a way, it forms a kind of a neat story. You know, there's a beginning and an end. We have the beginning of the First World War, which kind of inaugurates the decline of Europe in its death throes, you know, civil war, which in a way lasts until 1945, and the Second World War, followed by, of course, the emergence of the two superpowers, the Cold War classically considered, which then, of course, ends in 1989 with the kind of happy triumph of protest and democracy in Eastern Europe. Now, of course, no story that is real, no real life story is ever so pat is ever so simple, is ever so nice. I hinted the other day at, of course, some of, shall we say, the darker sides of the event of 1989. Um, you can look, for example, what happened in Romania, where it seemed that the country was, quote unquote, freed from communism when Ceausescu and his wife were murdered, um, essentially in retaliation for the way they had treated the country, except we later learned, of course, that this whole thing had been orchestrated by communists who more or less retained power under other guises. Uh, we saw what happened with the emergence of the mafia, as I talked about that, in most of the former communist countries. I suppose most famously in uh, Bulgaria, um, with the wrestler mafia, my, my favorite of the post-communist mafias. They were all former wrestlers. You know, it got to the point where in Bulgaria, even if you had a late model BMW, you didn't actually need to lock your car so long as you had the right sticker on it saying that you had paid off the local mafia chieftain. <laughs> Whereas if you had not, of course, no matter what your car was, no matter how many locks you put on the doors, it would get stolen. Um, the Soviet Union, of course, famously the rise of the mafia in what's sometimes been called uh, gangster capitalism or the Wild East. Uh, all those crazy stories about uh, profiteering rackets and so on. The story of 1989, that is, it began with great promise and then I suppose you might say life intervened. Um, what I want to look at though, because if you just focus on uh, the Soviet bloc and the Americans, you think about the Cold War. I mean, in some ways it's curious because at the beginning of the 20th century, everyone talked all about Europe, right? The European powers, the Western powers, imperialism. What happened to Europe? I mean, that's, that's one way of looking at the question. There's a book published a few years ago by a former teacher of mine called Jim Sheehan. Uh, the title was, Where Have All the Soldiers Gone? You know, you look at Europe in 1914, this famous kind of almost garrison civilization. You know, everyone actually has among their identity papers, they actually have a draft card because everyone has either served in the military or will serve in the military. The men, of course, I'm not talking about the women. And then you have these immense armies that came into being and just collided in this colossal, almost like a civil war of European civilization. I mean, today in some ways it would seem absurd, of course, for France and Germany to go to war again not simply because they've patched up their differences, but because, I mean, Germany? Think of Germany even fighting a war today. It would be an extraordinary thought. Germany, of course, a country of pacifists and greens. Germany, a country where, um, it's an interesting story. Uh, shortly after the news about bin Laden's death hit the airwaves, this is a true story. Several Dutch lawyers went to their local police station, this is just last week, uh, to report Barack Obama for murder. Because Barack Obama had gone on television and described the operation which targeted and killed Osama bin Laden. They actually tried to initiate criminal proceedings against the US president for murdering bin Laden. Now what was even more interesting than this was that a couple of Germans did the same thing in regard to their own chancellor, Angela Merkel. She was not guilty of murder. However, according to a certain law on the statutes in Germany, if you endorse or celebrate murder, you can be prosecuted. And because she more or less endorsed Obama's action in targeting Osama bin Laden, she has now been targeted. That, of course, is another question. <laughs> In a court of law, that may not even be enforceable because they haven't actually produced the pictures. That's true. The point here, though, is that what has happened to the Germans? I mean, the Germans, do you remember them? The Germans with their immense armies, with their world-conquering armies, 
with their militaristic spirit and values. The Germans that nearly conquered the world in 1918 with the Brest-Litovsk Treaty nearly did the same thing again under the Nazis in the Second World War. The Germans are now a country of pacifism. How did this happen? Were they castrated? <laughs> what has happened to the Germans? Well, I'm not going to give an answer. It's a question I want you to mull over. I'm going to read you now a parable. I want you to mull over this too. It's quite famous if you know your philosophy. I don't know if anyone has read Nietzsche or pretended to read Nietzsche. Um, this is from one of his more interesting books. It's called The Gay Science. Now, he meant gay as in happy, not as in homosexual, which is, of course, the dual meaning in English. Gay as in happy, the old meaning of gay. From The Gay Science, 1882. A parable. Have you ever heard of the madman who on a bright morning lighted a lantern and ran to the marketplace calling out, I seek God, I seek God. As there were many people standing about who did not believe in God, he caused a great deal of amusement. Everyone was laughing. Why is God lost, said one. Has he emigrated, said another. The people cried out, all laughing, all in a hubbub. So the insane man then jumped right into the midst of them and transfixed them with his glances. Where is God gone, he called out. I mean to tell you, we have killed him, you and I. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. The holiest and mightiest that the world has hitherto possessed has bled to death under our knife. Who will wipe the blood from us? With what water could we cleanse ourselves? Shall we not ourselves have to become gods? And here the madman fell silent. And his hearers were also silent, and they looked at him with surprise. At last he took his lantern and threw it on the ground, so that it broke in pieces and the light was extinguished. I come too early, he said. I am not yet at the right time. This prodigious event has not yet reached men's ears. Nietzsche was something of a prophet. Um, the God is dead quote, one of the most famous statements of modern philosophy. I suppose it was premature in some ways. In other ways, it was maybe almost excessively uh, predictive. In Europe, God might be dead. It's not, of course, dead in other places where people still have faith and they still believe. But if you look through Europe today and you see all the churches empty of, well, Europeans, <laughs> there are people in them. They tend to be from other places. They don't tend to be from Europe. You see, of course, the declining birth rate, the collapse of the family and all of this. And what can you think now? As the madman said in Nietzsche's prophecy, what are these churches now if they are not the tombs and monuments of God? Nietzsche also uh, foresaw a little bit more literally. He made a couple of direct prophecies. He said that once men stopped believing in God, they would, quote, invest their faith in barbaric brotherhoods with the aim of the robbery and exploitation of the non-brothers. I give you the Nazis. I give you the communists. He also said that the 20th century would see, quote, wars such as have never been waged on earth. And apparently, he actually said they would begin around 1915. Hmm. So he was off by a year, but he was pretty close. He also said, finally, that the death of God would also mean the death of truth with a capital T, the rise of relativism. That is the idea that all values are relative, that there is no absolute truth. There is no such thing as facts. Um, luckily, I think Turkey is a country where this particular truth is not yet registered. But if you've ever spent time in the humanities department of a major Western university, you know exactly what Nietzsche was talking about. Uh, or if you watch television, you know, you listen to the newspapers and the universal skepticism and irony and cynicism of the modern world. Um, it's kind of sad when you think about it. On the other hand, maybe it was inevitable. Another philosopher said, I've forgotten his name, that once people cease to believe in God, they will believe in anything. That is, they will have new face. Uh, environmentalism, global warming, uh, feminism, race theory, post-race theory, post-colonialism. All of these kind of uh, pseudo-philosophies that have arisen in the West. 
Actually, some people I think have described it interestingly. In Germany today, Germany, it, it's easy to single out Germany, but it's such an interesting example. You know, Germany, where obviously people no longer have the faith in God that they once did, they also no longer have the faith in patriotism that they once did. So what do they have faith in? What do they believe in? Well, you can see that they have about like eight different types of containers for, you know, recycling garbage. And it's very interesting. It's almost like a ritual. You know, your garbage is supposed to be cleansed. This is the modern environmental movement. Uh, you know, it starts, of course, with common sense. You should reuse bottles. You should reuse cans and not waste, you know, garbage. But it has actually turned into something like a religion. There's actually a party in Germany. They're called the Greens, of course. It's one of the largest political parties. In fact, they often form coalition governments. And the Greens don't just believe in things like recycling and not wasting water and all of the other things that a lot of people agree about. They believe essentially that nuclear power is evil. And so you should not actually pursue even peaceful uses of atomic energy. They have that as a kind of almost religious faith in, I suppose as it was called, Gaia, Mother Earth. This is what you get then. You no longer have the faith in the Christian God. Instead, you have faith in just about anything else. The interesting thing about it, though, is that I suppose people outside Europe could almost have a little bit of, uh, to use the German phrase, um, schadenfreude. Have you heard that phrase? <laughs> schadenfreude. It's a great German word. Schadenfreude. Basically, schaden, you know, it, it's similar to the word for shadows, but it means kind of like sorrow. And then Freude being the German word for happiness or joy. So what it means is joy in the sorrows of others. <laughs> it's like you, you have a malicious enjoyment in other people's suffering. It's a great German word. I highly recommend that you use it. Schadenfreude. So you might say, well, look, I mean, the Europeans, after all, conquered the world. You know, they colonized Africa, much of Asia, the Americas. And so all of this is, uh, uh, to use another philosopher's phrase, that's Karl Marx, uh, the chickens of imperialism coming home to roost. That wasn't actually Marx's phrase, but it's a popular phrase among Marxists. The schadenfreude approach then would be to say, well, look, the Europeans are getting their just desserts as their, their confidence in their civilization crumbles. Now Europe, you might say, is being recolonized. Uh, the Spanish word, the Reconquista, this originally applied, of course, to the reconquest of Spain by the Christians. That is from what they called the Morse, if you remember, their word for the Muslims, predominantly North African, although not exclusively, you know, who had conquered Spain and ruled Spain for most of the medieval period. The Reconquista actually has, in some ways, an even more resonant meaning in modern America, where it, of course, refers to the Mexican, the kind of ongoing demographic surge of the Mexicans in the Southwest. Um, Americans are sometimes reminded of the fact that the Southwest was, of course, conquered by force of arms from Mexico. Uh, that was in the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 48. Actually, some of the territory, like a southern strip of California, Arizona, and New Mexico, was actually purchased later on in the treaty in 1853. But many Mexicans actually no, no longer recognize, if they ever did, America's claim to those territories. And so if you ever get them talking over drinks, and in fact, some organizations even have this as their official motto, that these territories belong to Mexico. So that's the Reconquista in America. In Europe, well, the Reconquista might well refer to the demographic surge, not just from, these days I suppose you usually hear it as you know, Islam and Christianity, but in some ways it's more a matter, I think, of geography. It's more a matter of Africa and Europe. You know, the surging masses coming north, basically. Um, there was a novel published in 1973 by Jean Raspail uh, in France. Now, interestingly, he got a lot of the details wrong. But it was kind of a dystopian future novel. The idea was that Europe would be faced with this dilemma because of some crisis in Asia, you know, some famine or something. And, and millions of boat people would emerge and try then to land on European shores. An interesting dystopian fantasy. The question was, what do you do? Do you let them in? Do you feed them? Do you give them visas? Or do you quarantine them? Do you fire? Do you not let them inundate your civilization? if the first million or just the first wave of another 10 million. 
Um, it's interesting that although he seems to have gotten the continent wrong, it's actually happening right now. I don't know if you've been following the news, but since the crisis has spread through North Africa, obviously Libya with the NATO intervention not seeming to douse any of the tensions, Tunisia, Egypt, refugees are now pouring into Europe, mostly through some of these islands like Lampedusa, one of the closest islands to the coast of Tunisia and Libya, um, which is now housing more refugees than than were there in the population. Um, the Schengen Agreement is actually breaking down right now because the European countries don't want to have to allow in refugees that are allowed into the point of entry. The whole idea of Schengen, of course, was no more borders inside Europe, and so the security, I guess, is supposed to be handled by the outside countries. But countries like Italy say, look, that's not fair. Why should we absorb all of the refugees? And the French say, well, that's not our problem. We don't want them. And then the other countries say, we don't want them. <laughs> there's, there's, there's kind of an interesting aspect of this beggar thy neighbor phenomenon. It was, it was true particularly between France and England. I don't know if you've ever heard these stories about the channel. But, you know, refugees trying to get into England because the welfare benefits are more generous than in France often try to jump the channel trains. And so they actually, like, hang out right along the coast, right where the trains go into the channel. And some of them actually die trying to do this. Not entirely unlike the way people would die trying to cross the Iron Curtain in the Cold War. I mean, you can't really stem this impulse. The impulse for, for lack of a better word, people wanting a better life, people you know, seeking a better life. In some ways, actually, another French philosopher, I think it was um, Raymond Aron, he wrote back in around 1961, and he said that this notion of kind of East versus West in the Cold War is already obsolete, that the real distinction in the modern world would be that of North and South, um, with obviously exceptions to the ge geographic rule. But his point being that the globalization of everything, meaning the fact that people could now look and see the way people live in other countries, would inevitably bring home to them the differences in the standard of living and so on. So the people would inevitably try to seek a better life somewhere else. You, know, you might say happiness and ignorance. Now, you know, people might still be ignorant in some ways, but they at least know about these other places that in previous generations they wouldn't have known about. So how do you handle these floods of people? Um, I mean, in some ways, Turkey is, I suppose, an entry point, one of the entry points for Europe, even though Turkey is not an EU member, because of course a lot of people try to come in through Turkey and then into Bulgaria, after which theoretically you're part of the European Union. A lot of people also come to Turkey because it's easier to get a visa here than other countries and they use it as a jumping off point. I mean, these huge waves in some ways are reminiscent of the time after the fall of the Roman Empire in the West. You know, huge movements of people for which no one was really entirely prepared. The United States famously is beset by this issue on its southern border. It's mostly Mexicans, but not exclusively Mexicans. The Mexicans themselves, of course, don't want people coming from further south, from places like Guatemala. The same thing is true if you look at Italy. Um, Libya was actually a transit point, and it still is for a lot of people who are coming from, of course, further south in Africa. You, know, you, you want to get to one country so you can get to the other. It's like leapfrogging almost from one country to another. So how the Europeans deal with this crisis, I suppose, is one of the great questions now of the next five or ten years. I mean, there's a demographic issue, obviously, and this fuels it too. The lack of faith in God has something to do with it. Probably simple prosperity has something to do with it too. But Europe, of course, famously has this birth rate below replacement. An average, if you look through the whole continent, of somewhere around 1.4, 1.5 children per woman, which is not enough to, quote, replace the population. You know, that's why the demographic projections have Europe attaining probably, it's usually described again as Islam Christianity. I mean, that, that's one way of looking at it. You know, another way is looking at it just the native born versus, you know, the people coming in, the newcomers. Not all of them are Muslim. Many of them are Christian. So it's not just Muslims and Christians. But the native born in Europe will probably be in a minority by a certain date. In a lot of cities, this has already happened, of course. Much like in the United States, it's interesting that the way people now try to twist their words around with issues of what they call minority rights in a place like California, because the minority is no longer a minority, and the majority is no longer a majority. California actually now has a, a so-called native European minority that is less than 50%. It's down around 40% now. 
uh, Hispanics, that is those of Hispanic Spanish speaking descent, have now basically achieved a, a majority in California. Which is not to say they've achieved political power, but they have achieved a majority. So the changing demographic balance of Europe is obviously going to have consequences. Not just in the long run, but possibly in the short run. With the rise of political parties that of course don't like this. Uh, you might have heard about the triumph of the true Finns uh, just a week or two ago in the news. Now, as usual, they're described primarily as an anti-immigration party, which is part of their platform. Um, another issue, though, which animates them, and this is another one of Europe's big issues, is that they don't like the bailouts. You might have heard of these, like bailouts of countries like, of course, Greece, famously, last year, which had this financial meltdown and which still has numbers which simply don't add up. Uh, I, I think my favorite, my favorite story about Greek finances was the one where, where people are paid something like, you know, they work 40 weeks a year and they're paid salaries for 60 weeks or something like that. You know, like they're, they're paid for weeks that don't even exist, basically. They've negotiated these sweetheart deals. You know, this you could call a decadence, you could call it lack of faith, corruption, laziness. I think the story that best encapsulated it for me, uh, I'm going to try to get the number right because it is a shocking number. It was about five or six years ago in France. Um, what was the number? Oh, right. There was a heat wave. It was actually more like, I guess, seven or eight years ago. August 2003, there was a heat wave in France in August. Not unusual. August is often a hot month. 15,000 elderly people died in their apartments. The interesting thing about this is not that they didn't have air conditioning, although I suppose that might have helped if they had air conditioning, but that they had no one watching after them. Where were their children and their grandchildren? Well, it was August. You know what French people do in August? They're on vacation. They have five or six weeks paid vacation a year. And so in August, everyone heads to the beach, the mountains, the lakes, wherever. So you had all of these elderly people whose own children and grandchildren aren't even looking after them. But then in a way, that kind of makes sense because the whole idea of the social contract in modern Europe, the, the welfare state, as it's usually called, I mean, perhaps oversimplified, but that's the idea, is that the state is supposed to take care of people. It's supposed to take care of everything from cradle to grave. It takes care of education, early child nutrition. It takes care of, to some extent, the workplace, job training, retraining. If you're out of a job, then unemployment benefits, welfare. And then at the end of your life, of course, early retirement. Many people in France famously retire almost at age 55 with pensions that are supposed to last until they die. I mean, the demographics and the, the economics of it, we now know, are unsustainable. These social security systems are, in essence, Ponzi schemes. You know, that is, one generation pays in, and the next generation begins taking the payout. It only works if you have an expanding population. If you don't, it's a Ponzi scheme. One of the reasons why, of course, they begin letting in all of these immigrants in the first place. I mean, if you go back to the 1960s, you know, then the argument, you probably heard of the famous Gastarbeiter, because in Germany, of course, predominantly Kurdish and Turkish, although not exclusively, all of these workers were invited in, initially on a short-term basis. The idea was to fill a labor gap as Germany was booming and rebuilding after the war. Then, of course, many of them stayed. It's true later on they clamped down a bit on immigration because they didn't want that many more immigrants to come in. But it became, it was a little bit like a bad habit in a way. You know, these European countries, because they weren't having children themselves, not enough anyway, to fuel the welfare state, they said, well, you know, let's let in more and more people and they will hopefully do the jobs and pay the taxes to support the welfare state. People make the same argument in America about Hispanic immigration. We don't have enough people to fuel Social Security, Medicare spending, et cetera, et cetera. It's a sign of decay, though. I mean, a country that cannot reproduce itself demographically, that cannot even pay for its own entitlement programs. Now, there are all kinds of consequences. Uh, people no longer taking responsibility for themselves, people thinking only of themselves, a kind of spiritual, we have this word, anomie. Anomie, it's kind of, um, it's a little bit like Jimmy Carter's word, malaise. 
you know, this notion of almost purposelessness, apathy. Apathy is literally not caring. You know, simply you don't care. There's nothing that motivates you. Because after all, if God is dead, as Nietzsche said, well, you're not doing things for God. So who are you doing them for? Well, maybe your country, right? Maybe you're going to serve your country in the military like you do here in Turkey. Oh, but then Europe doesn't really need a military, does it? I mean, they have militaries, kind of. The Americans handle their defense. So the Americans are partly to blame, at least for this aspect. I mean, I sometimes wonder about this because, I mean, as an American who worries about my own country's public finances, the kind of thing that gets my goat is the idea that we still have, what, 65,000 soldiers in Germany. Doing what, exactly? Eating apple strudel? Are they defending the Germans against the Russians? Uh, Germany and Russia are closer now than Germany and America in a lot of ways. You know, Germany is a leading trade partner of, of Russia. So we don't seem to be defending them from the Russians. I'm not sure what they're doing there exactly. I guess even the US has an anti missile Yeah. Like, uh, that is true as well. I mean, they, there are, yeah, and even there, again, it's the theoretical Russian threat which seems to justify it. And you can understand the perspective of the East European countries that not long ago, you know, were living under the threat of Soviet domination. You can understand why they would want, you know, as they put it famously about eight years ago, they were in the middle of a spat with the French about something or other, and I think it was um, either Vaclav Havel or some Czech, you know, who said, um, we have learned not to trust French security guarantees, you know, going back, of course, to the late 1930s. Um, the Baltic states, too. I mean, they were literally part of the Soviet Union, of course, until the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. They remembered, in their case, it's more the Germans. They remember being carved up in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1939. So you could understand why those countries want an American security presence. But why would the Germans want 65,000 American soldiers there? There's a kind of almost infantilization that comes with allowing another country to handle your own defense. No, it's true there are still US bases in Turkey, but I don't think anyone would claim that the Americans are handling Turkey's own defense. I mean, Turkey has the second largest army in NATO behind the Americans, you know, an army which has been deployed on many occasions. The French, it's true, they sort of kicked the Americans out much earlier than the Germans did, you know, way back in the 1960s. But strangely, there are even American troops in Italy. There are American troops in Korea. Um, so these, the footprint, the legacy, it's almost like inertia. You know, it's, they're there because they're there. No one really knows why they're there. It's probably not good for either country, though. If you're talking about the Germans and the Americans or the Koreans and the Americans. Not good for the Koreans because, well, they don't take responsibility for their own security. Not good for the Americans because, well, they're paying for it. We can't afford it. You know, we're broke. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe there will be some kind of a shakeout where the Americans finally decide they can't afford to station troops in Europe. The Europeans have to suddenly grow up again and think about their own defense, which maybe gives them a bit more purpose in life so that they don't you know, waste all of their time on kind of video games and porn and whatever else it is that Germans are into. <laughs> no, I mean, it's easy to pick on the Germans. There are a lot of very positive things about modern Germany. You know, they still build things. This is not true of the United States, which has outsourced its manufacturing base. The Germans still do build a lot of high-end products. They build machines. You know, they supply the Chinese with machine tools. Um, they produce, obviously, high-end, world-class pharmaceuticals, cars, you know, all of those things. The Germans still build a lot. But that said, a country which is so successful in so many ways still seems to have an identity crisis, a, just a, a lack of understanding of, of what it is and, and its people and what their purpose is. Did, did you want to contribute something? They put on their military capacity. That's why they don't have any powerful military in Europe. Well, um, that you would have expected that after the Second World War. Japan actually did write into its constitution, in part at American insistence, you know, that they would not actually build a proper military. Uh, the Germans, though, because of Cold War concerns, because of the primacy of Berlin in the Cold War, the Germans were actually enlisted as full NATO members, so that the Germans actually were expected to build up a pretty serious military force. And they're actually, they're not incompetent. I mean, the Germans are, they're really good. Like, if, if NATO ever does comparative exercises and things like, 
um, you know, your skill you know, as a fighter pilot. The Germans are all the way up at the top. They're still good at it. They just don't really do very much of it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, the U.S. have all those soldiers in Germany for mm -hmm. whatever they're doing. They're probably collectively collecting information or something. But what does Germany get as a return of the favor? We pay money. We pay rent on the bases, and the soldiers spend their money in Germany. How much money are we talking about? Well, you think about 65,000 soldiers, including support personnel, you'd probably have to go up closer to 100,000, including civilians. All of them paid, you know, regular decent wages. So let's call it 100,000 people, you know, being paid maybe $50,000 a year. I knew you could do the math there. That's pretty good money. Um, and then on top of that, you also have you know, the deployment of various technology and so on. And they, of course, require things for the military supplies, which they buy locally. So economically, it's a boon for Germany. You're right that in a lot of other ways, you wouldn't think the Germans would like it. Why would you want to have these you know, bossy Americans, many of whom don't even speak German, you know, hanging around bars in Heidelberg, butchering German when they speak it. <laughs> um, you would think a lot of Germans wouldn't like that. And a lot of Germans don't. I mean, the Germ the Greens, obviously, are not particularly pro-American. Um, the Social Democrats, yeah, they're, you know, they're not anti-American, but they're not super fond of the Americans. Merkel is famously more pro-American than many Germans, in part because she comes from East Germany, so she grew up under communism. Um, but that said, Generally speaking, anti-Americanism is pretty prevalent in Germany. So you would expect, right, that they wouldn't want the Americans to be there. But it's a little bit like the Koreans. I mean, it's that whole, you know, be careful what you wish for, you just might get it. Whenever the Americans talk about actually leaving Korea, then suddenly Koreans decide they don't really want them to go. Um, so I don't know about that. Um, I personally think it would be much healthier for both sides, you know, if Korea went back to being Korea and handling its own defense, and Germany went back to being Germany. It's true that in Germany you had the guilt issue, you know, related to the Holocaust. The Germans are very big on this, trying to repair their image in the world. Public relations. They have all these programs to bring people to Germany, to show them Germany, to show that we're not like you, you know, heard about in your textbooks. And I think all of that is to the good. The Germans have gone much further than the Japanese have in facing up to the crimes of their past. I mean, strangely, even books on the Holocaust, on the, the worst crimes committed by the Germans, actually sell very well in Germany. I think all of that is to the good. I still think, though, that you ultimately have this problem of purposelessness in modern Europe. I mean, this is obviously related to the birth rate. I mean, you have children if you believe in something, you know, if you believe in the future, if you believe in family, you believe in your country. Um, countries that still produce children don't seem to have the same problem. Maybe it's prosperity. You know, Europe has gotten too rich for its own good. But I'm not sure if that's true. I don't think you can ever be too rich. <laughs> I think that, that Europe is in the process of a kind of existential crisis right now. Um, it has not yet figured out what its role in the world is. Um, there's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of lingering guilt for Obviously, the Holocaust, in which the Germans were by no means the only guilty parties, they had a lot of help from their neighbors in disposing of you know, Jews, gypsies, Slavs, etc. Um, there's a lot of guilt about imperialism. We talked about that in England. This notion of, again, it's kind of this unease with one's own past. Strange, because in some ways you'd think it'd be the kind of thing you'd be proud of. Not necessarily, obviously, the crimes and mistakes of imperialism, but that your country was a global power. You know, kind of like the Russians now lamenting the fall of their power. You'd think there'd be more of this in Europe. You know, the French wishing they were still this, there is some of that in France, you know, <laughs> wishing they were still this great country with, you know, pride in their achievements and civilization and so on. You know, in a, in a curious way, this, this is one of the oddest things, that, that the, the self-searching has gone so far, particularly in Europe and America, where, you know, even in school and the history textbooks, you, you learn a little bit about your country's good qualities. But these days you learn all kinds of things about everything that went wrong and the crimes you committed. It's good up to a point. We should all face our past. You know, and this is true in Turkey, obviously, just as it is anywhere else. We should face up to the mistakes and the crimes committed by our ancestors and predecessors. But you shouldn't wallow in it, because you should also, also focus on the good things. 
You know, you should also have pride in the achievements of your ancestors. And, you know, that's where I think the Europeans might have gone too far in the direction of guilt and, you know, self-loathing. Where now people talk about, you know, why is Islam doing so well in Europe that even Europeans are converting to Islam now? It's not just that immigrants are coming in. And where does that come from? Well, it's curious, like, if, if you talk about a country like England, well, let's say you come to England, you know, as an immigrant, and you're expecting... Uh, this is a good example of this, actually. Some Turks that I know who, uh, you know, who went there on like student exchanges as teenagers. Uh, have any of you been to England on this sort of a thing? You you were there when, like in in school then? It was my sister. You visited with? My sister. Yeah. She lived there. She lived there with a family. Yeah, with her husband. Yeah, I'm curious. Like, was the f oh no, with her husband? So it wasn't like with a the family then. Ah, okay, slightly different. Now, the issue I was going to talk about, it's interesting that, you know, the whole idea of a student exchange is that you go to a country and, like, you live with a family so that you absorb their culture and learn about how they live. But apparently this was happening to a lot of Turkish families, that they would actually end up being placed with, you know, Pakistani families. Um, and a couple of them got in trouble because the Pakistani families expected that they wouldn't drink because they expect, well, aren't you Muslims? You know, you shouldn't be drinking. And it's an interesting story, in part because, again, it gets to this whole notion of nationhood and identity and so on. And you could understand the sentiment, but on the other hand, the Turkish exchange students thought they were going to England. And, you know, was it England or was it sort of a different country inside of England? Um, and obviously the population of, you know, Pakistanis and Sikhs and Indians is very high in England. Um, and multiculturalism, the idea that we're supposed to respect all cultures, which is very predominant right now in modern England like it is in America. There's obviously a lot to be said for that, for tolerance. You know, on the other hand, it is not completely compatible with the law system, you know, with the civil law, with civil codes. And you would think that the English would try to insist that everyone obeys the same laws and rules and customs. But it gets harder and harder to do that. The, the late Ottoman Empire, which we looked at, I guess, last term, was famously a multicultural country. And look at how difficult it was you know, for the groups to get along. It's curious that all of the evidence of human history suggests that cultural and racial and religious diversity is very difficult. Because it's very difficult for people of different backgrounds to get along. And yet in the West now, it's almost as if people have decided that this is the goal. Um, so you can see why they're beginning to have trouble with hot button issues, you know, headscarves in France, um, you know, issues in England uh, related to, people are even talking about Sharia law and whether certain areas should be allowed to live under Sharia law if that's what they want to. There's actually a debate, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, even chimed in. This is you know, a member of the Anglican Church who said, yes, we should consider adopting Sharia law in certain areas of England if that is what people, you know, think is best. And it may well happen. You know, or it might not happen. There might, be, there might be a serious reaction. You know, it may be like in Finland that people decide, look, you know, we want Finland to remain Finland. Um, I mean, my own view on all of this is that I like countries to kind of be themselves. <laughs> I want Turkey to be Turkey. I want Germany to be Germany. It's nice to have, I think, a little bit of blending. And, and America, I talked about this, uh, I think, in a, a few lectures before. I mean, this, the, the notion of America as being this boring white bread country before with, like, famously disgusting food and all of that. <laughs> this, is, this is what Americans joke about, you know, that, well, we lost all these wars, but at least we got good restaurants. You know, and that's, that's nice, I guess. It's, it's nice to have good restaurants. Um, it's also nice to have pride in your own country and its culture. That's actually one of the most interesting things to me about, about Turkish culinary culture is that you don't have a lot of ethnic restaurants here. You have a few, like in Istanbul there are a few more, but basically people like Turkish food here. Well, you're Turks, so you would think you would like Turkish food, right? I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's good for countries to have some kind of pride, to have some kind of feeling, again, that our country, our nation, our values are actually worth celebrating, standing up for, learning about in school, and so on. I think this is the real problem of modern Europe. Uh, you know, where have all the soldiers gone? However you want to phrase the question, it's just people aren't sure who they are anymore. You know, you've got the anime, the malaise, the apathy, the inertia, just this kind of general feeling of purposelessness in life. 
I mean, it's not bad, obviously, modern Europe, if, if all you really want to do is, you know, live a decent life and have reasonable food and, you know, have the government pay for your health care and all of that. It's not a bad life. There's not much point to it unless you figure out how to give it point. Did you have a question or a comment? Yeah. I was actually going to say something about mm. the theory. A theory, okay. About that, you know, whole national pride thing. Yeah. It's going to decline. It's, it's probably go you know, lower and lower in every year, every day. Why do you think it will go lower and lower? That national pride, yes. because the media will well, I'm, I'm denigrate it. Is that what you mean? Western societies. I'm talking mm. about the latest generation of mm -hmm. Western societies. Yeah. You know, the 60s had the spirit, but the time was wrong, you know. Mm. Just after the war and so on and so forth. But right now, I don't know about the Beatles, but Lady Gaga is actually more popular than Jesus Christ. So what does Lady Gaga mean for Western civilization? Well, I barely even know who she is, honestly. I haven't really been following. T tell me who Lady Gaga is. Who is Lady Gaga? That's a really hard uh, question to answer. <laughs> what, are you saying like you're not sure if it's a man or a woman or a... Uh, yeah new kind of society all over the world, you know, mm. a new society where yeah. there's actually no borders, you know, one single capitalist economic mm. model, so to say, and people feel the feeling of, you know, being a world citizen through the social media. What was the Red Hot Chili Peppers song? Californication, right? That's right. All dreams become alike. Yeah, I, I share that concern. I hope it doesn't happen. It is happening to some extent. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, it's not happening with everyone, though. It's happening with the people who are plugged in. I mean, that's the word on some of these so-called Arab revolutions, the Facebook revolutions, right, that people everywhere begin to think the same way. I'm skeptical. I think that on the surface, people might listen to the same music. They might follow the same celebrity stories and gossip. They might talk about the same Hollywood actors. But at root, I think people are still pretty different in different places. Um, yeah, just the, the, the last comment I'm, I'd make about that is that um, I think I mentioned it last term, the, uh, get, to get back to IR and IR theory, uh, the Thomas Friedman theory, uh, the Golden Arches theory. Do any of you guys remember this? The Golden Arches theory. This is, uh, it's a variant on what they call democratic peace theory. The idea that no two countries in which McDonald's operates will go to war with one another, right? Well, he unveiled this in, in the New York Times in March of 1999, just about 10 days before the combined forces of NATO began bombing Belgrade. Uh, despite the existence of at least three or four local McDonald's fran franchises in Belgrade. Now, the interesting thing about that is, yeah, on the surface, it's true. And this is what people thought in the 90s. I'm sure you've all heard of, you know, the Fukuyama theory, right? The, um, the end of history, right? You all probably had to read the article or something like that. And, and there, there, it was a kind of a triumphalist narrative back in the 90s. Everyone is becoming liberal, liberal, liberal Democrats. You know, everyone listens to the same music. That isn't how it was put, but it's, it's a similar idea that everywhere is becoming like everywhere else. Um, it's happening in some ways, but in other ways, I think it's not. In other ways, I hope it's not. Because as I said, I like for countries to remain themselves. I think you're right. We should not all be paying attention to Lady Gaga. But look at me. I'm an exception. I don't even know who Lady Gaga is. I know that it's some character I'm supposed to have heard of. But honestly, I don't even know. Um, I suppose there are other characters. Like, uh, Are you following the Charlie Sheen story? Charlie Sheen. OK, so the Charlie Sheen. Who else? Well, OK, Osama bin Laden. I guess everyone followed that story. That's obviously big news. But that's the thing is, the people, they might have the same reference points, but I think people still think about them differently. Um, so anyway, I hope it doesn't happen. I hope that globalization does not sweep across the world and turn everything, every place into identical variants of other places. I don't think it's really going to happen, though. I think in the end, you know, people make their own history. And in any country, you know, whether it be Turkey or Germany or you know, Japan, Italy, any of the countries we've talked about this term, they have a certain 
you know, glue, a certain thing which makes them themselves. There's some flexibility and they can change. Um, but there's still a kind of national character, I think, in most of these places. You know, even in America, despite America's immense sort of multicultural experiment or whatever you want to call it, there's still a kind of American identity. I mean, you can look at me. You can probably tell I'm American, even though I've been living outside the country for, I don't know, a dozen years. There's still something, I think, that distinguishes countries. And I hope that endures because, after all, as, as, a, as a diplomatic historian in the IR department, if we didn't have countries, what would we talk about? You know, if we just had a new global empire. Um, and it doesn't look like this American empire everyone was talking about five or ten years ago. Uh, if it exists, that it's going to last very long. So I think we're back in what the Chinese like to call interesting times. That's a curse, actually. May you live in interesting times. I think we're all living in one of those.